What's up and welcome to another MoGraph MoCast. I'm Dave. And I'm Matt. Joining us today is one of my favorite people in the entire world, Mr. Russ Gautier. Hey, hey, happy to be here. And MoGraph is a supplement to our site, MoGraph.com, which is a motion graphics tutorial site with tutorials, plugins, podcasts, and other MoGraph stuff. And on the show, we talk about everything ranging from motion graphics to Cinema 4D, After Effects plugins, render engines, doing business, doing taxes, being a contractor... We're working for the man. You can email us, info at MoGraph.com, and let us know what you think about the show. Questions, comments, concerns, queries, grievances, show topic ideas, send them over. Let us know what you want to hear. I think that uh, I'm going to do a listener survey pretty soon. Are we? Because I think after 216 episodes, we should do a survey. Yeah, maybe. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I just want to see, um, yeah. <laughs> I wanna see what people are enjoying. You know, you know. Um, Make sure to put people's people on there. You know, do you enjoy people's people? Yeah. I bet you'll get a resounding no. I mean, I don't don't feel like I really have to because everybody will say yes. Right. Okay. (laughs) Um, So, yes, this is our Mm. first episode that we are not broadcasting on all the old things. Mm -hmm. So if you're not hearing this, that's because you're not subscribed. (laughs) So if you're wondering why you're not hearing us right now. Yeah, Wait we're going to get emails. Where's the new episode? Well, it's mm-hmm. your fault. Sorry, bruh. Um, so I did want to just do a week wrap up just real quick. Not much to talk about. I was out of town. I just got back literally a couple hours ago from Detroit. Tried to hook up with Billy mm-hmm. while I was there, but he was um, he was doing some stuff. He was uh, out of the city at the moment. And uh yeah, it just didn't just didn't work out, but I'm sure I'll be seeing him pretty soon. And um, so yeah, I just got back <laughs> just just in time to get the notes done and sit down and do the show. So um, all right. The other thing is that very finally, well thought out, pre- prepared show. I'm sure. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, well, organizing the or, notes, yeah, not necessarily yeah. okay, writing. Okay, all okay. I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> but. The, other th- the only other thing, oh, you you had something go go viral. You had something hit the oh. front page of Reddit yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was fun. So I've been going yeah. through uh, this course that we're about to put out, Mark Fancher's Houdini, uh, Stop Being Afraid of Houdini course. And so uh, I was on chapter nine, uh, the vellum one, where we were creating some vellum grains and stuff like that. It was very cool. And so I, you know dilla animation and he does this cool thing where he spreads it out and it says wow you know it's like a texture stuck to the the thing and i did one and it was a dick butt and, you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's my first gold i got reddit gold i was very excited oh you're oh, gonna show you it really? okay yeah i got reddit gold yeah, yeah, yeah. oh that's funny <laughs> so <clears throat> man it had a lot of uh upvotes it had like yeah it was 7, like 10, upvotes 000. on reddit 10, oh 000. was it really yeah i got up to ten thousand. Yeah. I was very happy about that. You know, that's that's really funny because you and Beeple both hit the front page of Reddit. Yeah, I know. That was was funny. Uh, Oh, thanks, Alex. (laughs) They gave me silver. Alex gave me silver in the chat. Oh, really? That's funny. Yeah. Oh, I I mean, thanks. I I, I take no credit for it. I just followed a bunch of instructions. You know, Mm. Mark is really the uh, the the genius behind it. But so, you put but the now dick you know butt how to it. make. I did. Yes, that was sure. all me. I had to Photoshop yeah. that dick butt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. it was funny because everybody is like, "Man, I forgot about that meme." I'm like, "You can't yeah. let that meme go." No, no I know. Classic meme. See, now it's the Epstein didn't kill himself meme. You know, that's true. That's that's so. True. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I got more if it had been Epstein on, didn't kill himself. Yeah. No. Nah, how, how do you do that on Flome? Really? I mean, you just make it a thick font. You know. Yeah, I guess so. It'll be fine. So, originally it said word on it because yeah, it spread yeah, yeah. the word. Oh, but, I didn't even think I didn't put yeah. that two and two together. Yeah, I didn't either. And then I was watching the back on the intro, and I was like, "Oh, that's 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 it. Spread yeah. the word." Yeah, got but it. But one more day of editing Great. left on that. I'm super <laughs> excited. Uh, um, I've been working on this uh, edit for so long, and I, I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna take a vacation afterwards, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> vacation. Then we have to too, do too bad work. I can't. Yeah, too much. I, to I get a vacation so. in three weeks because I'm having a baby. Is that a vacation? Though? Quotes. 
Vacation. Vaca- yeah, vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> Ariev is going to guest host while you're having a baby. So. Yay. Yeah. Maybe awesome. maybe we'll have the baby early enough to where I can Skype in and say hi. From the, with, from the yeah, hospital? Yeah, from the hospital with my new baby. Oh, that'd be it's cool. like right that'd as cool. where she's in labor and I'm like live streaming. What up, y'all? Uh-huh. <laughs> she's in the background you do this to me i hate you <laughs> get off the phone <laughs> why are you always working <laughs> oh man uh but um yeah we're just gonna dive right into it today because i feel like we've got questions but, like the listeners are gonna have some questions Fantastic. and for those who have never met you before uh, it's a shame I- if they haven't. <laughs> IRL or on the interwebs. <laughs> Tell everybody what you do and what what you're most known for artistically. Oh man. Yeah, that's uh what I do is 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 a pretty broad question, I guess, but I'll start there. So I I would say I'm a motion graphics designer, animator art director i've been creative director um i've i've kind of played a lot of roles um i also uh do a lot of education so i taught at uh at sva for a couple years taught uh houdini to graduate and undergraduate students which was a lot of fun um yeah those are those are the the kind of broad strokes um Mm -hmm. what i'd spent the last five years doing i was um hired up as art director at Perception and later promoted to associate creative director. And I was there for five years. Perception, Mm -hmm. um, their big thing is, at least publicly, is is Marvel movies. They actually Mm -hmm. do a lot of work in the the tech sector as well. Tons of automotive work. Yeah. um, Mm -hmm. Work for like almost every major tech company you can think of, they'd done work for, uh, which was fascinating. But of course, being the tech world you can't really show or tell or talk about any of that stuff pretty much ever um mm-hmm. so the marvel yeah. the the feature film work i will say because it wasn't just marvel we did work for warner brothers and um a few others as well legendary as well i think mm-hmm. but the marvel movies were the things that really like publicly perception is known for and uh for the last five years i'd spent a lot of time a lot of time working for uh for marvel on their movies I'm sure yeah now the, those tech companies um i we, we can't mention specifically who or what they are correct are you able to say what type of work that was so perception because i know but i don't want to say anything without you know <laughs> i know oh, totally. i just want to see if you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so perception really kind of filled this interesting niche of being um, like almost like future tech consultants in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did a lot of conceptual work, uh, a lot of kind of forward thinking visualization of technology in the future. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. it was near future. Sometimes it was very far future. Um, but it was a really fascinating area to work in. Uh, they called it sci-fi thinking, which was this, uh, this notion of applying sort of the principles of science fiction uh, to modern technology and sort of near future technology, which was uh, a really fascinating space. It allowed for a lot of um, really interesting conversations and conceptual developments and, uh, and all kinds of stuff. It was, uh, it was fascinating projects for sure. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where it's like life imitating art. You know, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, because yeah. like we do all the work for the Marvel movies, tons of technology for the Marvel movies, lots of like HUDs mm-hmm. and FUI and and you know, yeah, sci fi technologies for Marvel. Uh, and of course, like all of the the people that work at these big tech companies, they go see Marvel movies just like everybody else does, yeah, and uh, yeah. you know, they start looking down the credits to see like who were the people that were making these crazy things and uh and they they eventually land on perception and and come Mm -hmm. and reach out i'm sure there's a significant amount of uh 
back and forth on that as well. I'm sure the uh, the guys do a lot of outreach in the tech community as well to mm-hmm. to talk to them about mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah, really, really interesting niche. So you taught. Um, where did yeah. you go to school? So to I went. Begin with? I went to Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. Um, I got a, a very traditional graphic design degree. Uh, mm-hmm. The school there, at least at the time, this was a really long time ago now. <laughs> um, uh, the school there was very heavy on the theory. Um, a lot of their professors were, you know, very steeped in kind of like Bauhaus style um, mm-hmm. graphic design, lots and lots of time spent like cutting out little things with an exacto knife on a, you know, a, a rubber thing and like pasting and, and that kind of stuff. Lots of conceptual graphic design as well. Like it wasn't mm-hmm. so rigid in that we were, you know, like laying out restaurant menus and that kind of thing. It was, mm-hmm. it was very heavy on the theory, lots of like poster design and, um, you know, lots and lots of typography, tons mm-hmm. of work with typography. Um, mm-hmm. So it was, it was a really good primer because for me, like the theory was what I really needed. Like I needed that, that kind of theory, that practice, uh, the yeah. critiques, like that was, that was the number one thing that, you know, like everything that you did was leading up to the critique for the class like that was it mm-hmm. the critique was the mm-hmm. thing that you got graded on that was the thing that, that every single really class mattered. was like that every class so wow. we had very few at least at the time we had very few technical classes almost everything was super heavy into the theory at least the classes that i took because that's really where where my interests lied um but you know, very heavy on theory, which was great for me because I pick up the technical stuff really easily. Like I, you know, I taught myself Photoshop and Illustrator and mm-hmm. all that stuff in order to to do what I wanted to do to kind of execute whatever idea I had in my head. That was the that was the easy part for me, picking up the technical side. The the hard part was really nailing down the concept and that theory and really kind of getting the the execution to follow what I had in my head. Mm-hmm. So that was, yeah. that was a lot of what, what school was. And I actually ended up, um, I taught there for a couple of years as well, like right after I graduated. So I had, I graduated in the fall and then two weeks later in the spring, I was teaching uh, an interactive design class and I had students of mine who were classmates like three weeks ago. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it was nuts. That's really it What is interactive design exactly, though? Mm. Oh, yeah. So at the time... Is it like Macromedia Director? Yeah, so <laughs> it was Flash at the time. Yeah. So it was... Close enough, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Flash, was, Flash was my jam for years. I loved wow. Flash. I still miss Flash in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, it just allowed for so much kind of flexibility and play in that kind of interactive space uh, where now I feel like it's so challenging not just to create something interactive but to publish something interactive takes like a team of people where like before with Flash I could sit down for a couple hours bang through some action script and have like a thing that I can share for free with literally anybody who has a flash plugin. And then of course, yeah. you know, the iPhone uh, pretty much killed flash and then all the security problems that it had pretty much killed flash these days. I mean, of course, flash is still used, but it's used for very different purposes now. So um, when you, <clears throat> let's see, I'm thinking of the timeline here when you, so, so you did that, and at what point did you? What what, uh, what city was that again? So I was in Richmond, Richmond Virginia. Right? Yeah, so Virginia. I, I grew okay. up in Arlington, right outside of DC. My dad was in the government at uh, at the Smithsonian. So we. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time at the Natural History Museum, which is where he worked. So basically, grew up around dinosaur bones and all kinds of stuff, which is cool. At the time, I didn't think it was that cool. I mean, I. I was into it, but like, I was like, doesn't everybody grow up with this? No, no, they, 
they don't. <clears throat> um, but that was that was. So fun. how did you end up in New York then? I guess. Oh the, man, yes. Like- so when I was. 14, I think our, our high school class took a trip to see the Statue of Liberty and I'd never been to New York and, you know, it's, it's something I'd seen in movies and pictures and everything, of course, but like, I'd never been there and, uh, totally fell in love with it. I was like, oh, I, I gotta live here. I gotta, at some point I've got to be here. This place is just amazing. So, Mm -hmm. um, I was in Richmond. I started in in school in Richmond. And then I was, I lived there for like 12 years. I worked at the Martin agency for a long time and a couple other places did some freelance around, uh, around there, which was great. But that, that New York city itch really like it needed to be scratched, man. I hit a point like Richmond is an awesome city. It's really, really cool. It's dirt cheap to live in. So like it tends to be a bit of a black hole. So people don't tend to escape the black hole all that often. Um, so I knew that if I had stayed for too much longer, I wasn't going to leave. Um, yeah. So I, I decided mm-hmm. to just, you know, rip the Band-Aid off and move to New York City, and it was life-changing. It was amazing. Incredible experience. And how old were you then? I was 33 when I moved okay. to New York. So, okay. uh, like, it's sort of... I will say the the general arc of my life is that I tended to do things a little later than everybody else, mm-hmm. um, but that usually worked to my benefit, at least the way that I like to approach things. Like I didn't start college till I was twenty two. Mm-hmm. I graduated at twenty seven, um, and then <laughs> a lot moved of people to, go to college for seven years. Yeah, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I learned a ton. Mm-hmm. Uh, moved to New York City when I was. 33 uh, and it was amazing it was an incredible experience it was super cool and now we're in la so, now yeah, you're in LA. <laughs> so, yeah yeah tell us about how wh- did that whole freelancing happen like how did that end up happening which which one <laughs> well going well the going freelance and moving to to la like oh yeah did you just decide one day or is it something you've been thinking about for a while so my wife and i have been talking about that for years long time mm-hmm. yeah california had been something that we both wanted to explore for almost as many years as we'd been together basically mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and we just kind of hit a point where like a, a a handful of things fell into place we'd we'd had a huge year in 2019 we actually got married last yeah. year so congrats yeah thank you very much um so that was of course a huge undertaking um we took a trip to italy we you know did all all kinds of things so last year was a it was a huge year for us and i think we just sort of hit the point where we're like well why not just make it even bigger and just like move to la like let's just let's just yeah. do that mm-hmm. um you know we she was at a point where she was kind of over her job and um we were both i think just at the end of the day feeling kind of exhausted by new york city like i loved i loved my time there i loved it it was uh, it still is uh, one of my favorite places ever um but it wears on you after a while you know like the the volume is turned up to 11 as soon as you step out of your apartment basically 24 (laughs) hours a day um yeah. And we we lived in Brooklyn, which was great. It was very compared to Manhattan, it was very quiet. Um yeah. but it's not a quiet place at all. Like it's a it's it's intense. Every single time you step out of your apartment is an intense experience. And over yeah. the years it just you know, it kind of wears you down a little bit. So we we're looking for a, a lifestyle change. We both really love doing things outdoors, so you know, California seemed seemed like a, a good place for us to, to move on to. And so now you're doing freelance. Um, do you have, uh, d- did you have like kind of a, a game plan for that going in or? <sighs> sort of. So I'd freelanced for a couple of years before joining Perception uh, in mm-hmm. New York City, and I, I absolutely loved it. Um, I was actually pretty resistant to, to coming on full time initially. Um, mm-hmm. Because I really loved being freelance. Like being mm-hmm. freelance was so much fun. I get to bounce around all over the place, work with different people. It was, it was incredible. Yeah. Um, 
so I knew a bit more of like what to expect. Like I'd done this before. Like it wasn't it wasn't a super new thing to me. So I knew that I would ultimately end up being okay, even if initially it was a little slow. Because um, mm-hmm. that's you know it's a it's a trajectory I've followed before. So it is what it is. Yeah. But I I initially my game plan was to move out here, spend you know, two or three weeks getting the website together, starting to hit up studios, seeing if I can drum up business. Um, But as it turned out, uh, I was hit up by imaginary forces pretty much immediately upon (laughs) uh, saying that I was going freelance. They actually, they brought me on for a project that I'm on uh, now. Mm -hmm. And they actually briefed me on the road when we were... um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when we Jeez. were driving out here. Yeah, it was nuts. Uh so we we took an R V trip uh across the country when we moved. Fun. So that was it was something that we'd both really wanted to do. And I'd done the cross country drive a few times, mm-hmm. um, but my wife never has. And so, you know, it was a great opportunity for, for her to kind of, you know, dictate where we go and what, and what we did see. You make? So we went south because right what we really wanted to go north, but driving an RV through the Rockies in the yeah. the fall when it's like kind of snowy mm-hmm. and nasty mm-hmm. and not, not so much. So we decided right. to go South. We went down through like West Virginia and Kentucky and Tennessee and uh, yeah. Oklahoma city. We, we sort of cut the, cut the corner of Texas, went down through like Lubbock mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. down to Arizona. We bummed around in Arizona for a while, New Mexico uh, and then uh, up to LA. It was amazing. That's fun. Yeah. I've always wanted to do a cross country RV trip. Yeah, dude, it was so cool. (laughs) It was so cool. Uh, I would absolutely recommend it. What would you do? Just like uh, uh, stay the night at the RV parks? Yeah. Absolutely. Man, that's so cool. Yeah. KOAs. (laughs) KOA all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And because it was the off season, we were traveling in, uh, in sort of late October, early November, which is the off season. So we, we didn't have to call ahead for reservations for the most part. We didn't really oh, have nice. any issues. Um, I feel like Roswell was the only place that we had to stay at like a local RV park as opposed to a KOA. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was so much fun, man. It was so cool. Yeah. It was so cool. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah. hashtag bucket types list. Of things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I'm sure there's plenty of NDAs and things we have to work around here, but, um, Mm -hmm. what types of things are you doing now? Like maybe like what kind of software are you using? That kind of thing. Sure. So, uh, I've been a cinema 4d diehard for a really long time. It's still Mm -hmm. my, you know, by far my number one, uh, tool of choice when it comes to, uh, design, animation, anything, um, Picked up Houdini a few years ago, and and you know obviously I, I taught that for a couple of years at, at SVA, so I'm at least familiar enough with it to uh, to yeah, impart yeah. some knowledge <laughs> upon the the uh, upcoming visual effects artists of the world. Um, but you know Cinema 4D and Houdini, I think I've I've started to really use those really um, in conjunction with each other. Like mm-hmm. uh, it's it's yeah. so easy to send things to Houdini and do some things and then send them back to cinema for rendering yeah. or additional animation yeah. or whatever. Like it, they, they work so seamlessly together now using Alembics or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially Redshift too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Redshift yeah. with the Redshift yeah. proxies and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Redshift is, is, um, definitely my, my number one renderer of choice for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love Redshift. <laughs> Uh, so those are, you know, that and, and After Effects, of course, uh, got to comp that stuff somewhere. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's uh, sort of my, my main toolkit these days, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's um, something that I'm finding just in, in editing this. I'm seeing what Mark's doing, and, and it's just so nice to be able to have that workflow. And I feel like, you know, Houdini is so powerful. And it has all this cool stuff, on, but it is very much under the hood. Yeah. You know, it's it's Cinema 4D with the hood up in a way. Yep. And you're doing all the things and you're crossing all the wires and stuff. But when you're done, it's nice to go back into Cinema 4D 
it's nice and comfortable. It's nice and intuitive. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. And it's easy fast. to use. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's funny because I've been doing all this training and I've been in Houdini for, you know, two weeks straight now doing all of it. And I've gotten so used to not using the one, two, three keys to navigate around <laughs> that oh, I jump yeah. back into cinema and I find myself just using the alt key the entire time, which a lot yeah. of people already do, you know, but that was not. That was not initial. And then I was trying to create some some redshift like materials and stuff. And I kept in, in C4E and I kept hitting the tab to bring up the thing to search my, uh, yep. my material. I was oh. like, why isn't this working? Yeah. <laughs> it seems to work this way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's um, it's really great because a lot of people are like, oh, you're moving to Houdini. You move into Houdini. It's like, no. It's not really a move to Houdini. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, like no. learning Houdini. Yeah. You know, and, and using that it's a, such a great combo. I kind of yeah. think of it as, um, as like a really good extension of Cinema 4D's capabilities, you know, like where, mm-hmm. where Cinema 4D's capabilities start to, you know, the, the curve starts to slope down a little bit. That's really where Houdini picks up and they, they work so well as like a, a combo package, uh, yeah. at least for, for the kind of stuff that I've been doing. It's, it's been invaluable. Um, yeah. but like I said, I've, I'm still, you know, a hundred percent diehard cinema 4d user. Like I love it. It's great. Yeah. yeah. It's like, if you're doing style <clears throat> frames or something like that, if you're doing, um, you know, animation, uh, anything, anything, it's, it's, it's amazing. So this, this whole year, it already, everybody's had kind of like this buzz about Houdini, like 2020 is the year of Houdini. I think it is. You know, last year, no, sorry, 2019 was the year that everyone said they were going to learn to Houdini. Yeah. 2020 <laughs> is the year that they're actually going to learn. Houdini. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It takes it takes a lot of repetition. I think you know you've got to see, especially when it, it does. comes to typing in uh, expressions and things like yep. that, and remembering yeah. what they are. Yep. You know, it takes a lot that's, of repetition on that. That's actually one of my favorite right. things about Houdini is being able to go into a specific parameter. Like, you know, you want to change the scale or something like that. Or uh, if you're if you're activating a certain node, you know, if you're turning it on or off, like being able to actually write a simple uh, uh, some simple script like hashtag F greater than 46. You know, that means at 46, you know, anything greater than 46 turn on. Yes. It's like mm-hmm. instead of actually having to create keyframes that you're going through and then creating all these, you know, unneeded keyframes, just typing in some code and being like, this is when I want it to start. You know? Yeah, it's yeah. it's a, a, a really interesting way of working. It totally forces you to think in a in a completely different way. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the reasons that I really enjoy kind of solving problems with it mm-hmm. um, is it's it's such a such a wide open sandbox that you can yeah. kind of do anything with but you can't use it like you would use cinema 4d or photoshop or something like that like mm-hmm. you have to use yeah. it in a different way it's it's so much fun i love it yeah like stripping attributes and stuff yeah. you know things like that and and uh mm-hmm. even like baking olympics getting info out of there that doesn't need to be in there yep. so mm-hmm. you can keep the file sizes low uh, what's the thing? Stripping attributes, you do like asterisk or something to delete all the attributes. Yeah, except asterisk for and then the carrot. carrot. Yep. <laughs> yeah. To keep carrot them. Yeah, I love yeah, yeah. that stuff. Yeah. It's super nerdy. Um, but speaking of which, because this is like Oprah, you get a Houdini course. <laughs> yeah. You get a Houdini course. So now you've got a Houdini course. Yeah, that's true. Um, tell us, tell us what you cover. Um, so the Grayscale Gorilla Plus. Houdini course is really geared towards cinema 4D artists specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's a ton of information out there in Houdini if you want to, you know, set something on fire, if you want to do water yeah. sims. Or, I mean, like, it's so heavily geared towards visual effects artists because that's, that's really the space that Houdini has occupied for a long, long time. For sure. Um, and it's only been in the past few years that we've started to see it be used more and more in the in the realm of visual effects uh, and also in the realm of motion graphics. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was there was kind of this gap where you know I'd seen a lot of people talking about how Houdini is really daunting, and it, and it can be, but it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. have to be. And I think if you can 
if you can lay a solid foundation of how to think like Houdini mm -hmm. wants you to think, it can actually mm -hmm. be, um, it can open a lot of doors in terms of really learning the software. Cause you can't, you can't approach it like anything else. Like you have yeah. to think about it from a different perspective. You kind of have to unlearn what you've learned about other 3D yeah. programs. <laughs> like if you yeah. go in and you start hitting all the shelf tools, like, you know, I mean, all those shelf tools at the top look super juicy. Like I want to go yeah, in and right? press <laughs> this. I want to make this object dynamic. But like, it's, it's presets. <laughs> and, but if you do that and you don't have anything in your scene, you're yeah. going to be confused because it's not going to do anything because right. it's asking you for an input. Yeah. Like, hey, what's <laughs> happening here? What's yeah. going on in, uh, in this crazy program? Um, so it's really, it's really geared towards getting Cinema 4D users acclimated to the way that Houdini wants you to think. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of like the basic stuff about, you know, attributes and groups and, mm -hmm. um, you know, splitting things up and using work streams, but, but kind of framed around Cinema 4D. So we start in Cinema 4D, we do a bunch of work in Houdini, and then we end in Cinema 4D. Um, cool. Mm -hmm. So it's really this kind of like round tripping process. And this, you know, it's, it's one of, of what is going to be several things that, uh, that we do over at uh, GSG plus. So I've got a bunch more planned for 2020. So that'll be, uh, that'll be coming soon. Cool. The year of Houdini. Year, year of Houdini. Houdini. Year of Houdini. Did you do Houdini stuff at Perception as well? Yeah. Or yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Black Panther was actually the first project where we really heavily used Houdini. Um, and actually the first project where we really heavily used Redshift. It was, uh, cool. It was, it was quite a thing, but yeah, we used Houdini a whole bunch on, uh, on Black Panther. We, we worked on that movie for a really long time, like 18 yeah. months. Wow. Um, so we were, mm. we were pretty deep in it. Uh, on the on the tech work and and Houdini was was really essential, especially when it came to all the sand stuff, because like all the holograms mm -hmm. are made of sand and that kind of thing. So yeah. conceptualizing and visualizing that kind of stuff so that the the filmmakers could take that and and you know use it as a guide for actors on set or for the vendors who are actually going to create the final look uh, of the holograms in the end. Um, Houdini was essential, and then we used it a ton for the title sequence and and for the mm -hmm. uh, the prologue at the beginning of the movie as well. Let me ask you this: when you're yeah. going through, when you're getting such a high profile job like you know Black Panther or something like that, or one of the big Marvel movies, it's like how how do they determine which shots? Because there were a lot of studios working on all these Marvel tons. movies. You watch the credits, tons. you'll see tons mm -hmm. and tons and tons of big name studios working on these. Yep. How yeah. do they determine I've, I've always which ones that. Yeah. you will work on and which ones other teams will work on? I, I'm, I'm assuming it's based on, you know, like their strengths and weaknesses and yeah. such, but like, oh, absolutely. I'm sure there's some where they're like, okay, here's the, do they go through and like, key the footage first before they give it to you or do other studios take it first and then give it to you or how does that work and it totally and depends how many too. shots do y'all end up doing over the course of one one movie <laughs> that <laughs> depends too so so it really it really depends on what their needs are you know mm -hmm. so we've been for a long time the uh the the owners danny and jeremy at uh at perception have had a a long standing relationship with uh with the executive team and kevin feige and everybody over at at marvel studios uh long before they were even making movies uh they they'd done some work with them mm -hmm. um so in the beginning the need was almost <clears throat> always for like holograms and fui and screen graphics and that kind of thing for sure um it really was, it was around the time of Doctor Strange that they came to us for something that wasn't necessarily a final piece. Mm -hmm. um, they'd asked us to, to help out with that like really crazy, super trippy um, kind of sequence in sort of the first third of Doctor Strange where he like travels through the multiverse and you know, has For all sure. this like crazy body horror stuff going on. So we, we did some conceptual work around that. 
And it really was all about kind of working at this sort of medium ish fidelity because we knew that like nothing that we were doing was for final shots and it was still gotcha. like very conceptual. Mm. So that kind of opened the door for a lot of these kind of conceptual experiments that so they, they still were coming to us for, for final shots. And for those, the trajectory a lot of times would start with, you know, here's, here's one sequence for screen graphics that we want you guys to do. And we've got other screen graphics in the movies, but we've got other vendors working on those. We've got holograms, but other vendors working on those. Mm -hmm. And we'll, you know, we end up with a sequence of, you know, let's say 15 shots, 20 shots, whatever it is. But then as the production rolls along and as things change and, and evolve and, you know, they, they always do reshoots. So they always have like a big chunk of shots that now need new vendors working on them or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times the, the ask tends to grow and, you know, we'll, we'll start a feature with, you know, a handful of shots or a couple sequences or a couple pieces of technology that appear in a few moments in the movie that needs some storytelling mm -hmm. um, visuals that go with them. And then that tends to grow and balloon into something that's, uh, that's significantly more than that. Um, Black Panther was a little different. So Black Panther came after we had done the sort of conceptual development work on Doctor Strange and, you know, we'd been working with Marvel Studios so much around technology and around um, this sort of like development of this. Like they're, they're really cool to work with because they, they really care about sort of the role that that plays in their movies and in the greater mm -hmm. MCU as a whole, which is, it's really, really cool because it, it could very easily go the other way. And we've worked with, um, with people who are just like, yeah, I don't know, just throw some blue shit on the wall. Who cares? Um, <laughs> it's just set dressing, right? Uh, right. To, yeah. to a lot of people. And, and fair enough. Like sometimes that stuff just exists to make the character look cool or like look super smart mm -hmm. or whatever. But yeah. You know, Marvel Studios has always seemed to to really care about the role that technology plays, and specific, sp specifically when it came to Black Panther, the world of Wakanda was entirely steeped in technology. Mm -hmm. They're like the most technologically advanced. Um, so we got involved with them really early on, like before the script mm -hmm. was even locked. Wow! Um, to help kind of conceptualize moments where technology would be very heavily featured. Mm -hmm. um, and even before that had started, they had come to us and asked for like a, like a tech audit, if you will, like, Hey, what are some cool, like emerging technologies or things that are out there that are really unique and interesting that we can start to kind of weave into this story that we're crafting. So we did this mm -hmm. sort of tech audit where it was really more, uh, it was entirely conceptual, um, like nothing that we had actually really produced aside from a handful of sketches and things. Um, and based on that, they came back and they were saying, you know, they would come to us with like a, like a six or an eight week chunk of time and said, okay, let's, uh, let's explore these three key technologies. What are some ways that these can function in the world? What are some ways that, you know, sand can be used to create an image or, uh, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. like if I had a, uh, we did a lot of work with the, the Kamoyo beads, the beads that they wear around mm -hmm. their wrist that turn into holograms and have all kinds of functions and features. The way that Black Panther's suit comes on this sort of like nanotechnology thing that like follows these like kind of, um, lighting tattoos, if you will, like under his skin where it kind of mm -hmm. like forms over his body. So we did tons and tons of work on that stuff. So we'd, we'd spent a really significant amount of time, well over a year, just doing these conceptual experiments and exploring and really working closely hmm. with them, uh, with the director, Ryan Coogler, with the entire executive team, with uh, Hannah Beachler. Beachler, I think is how you pronounce her name. She's the, she was the production designer who actually won an Oscar for the movie. Wow. Um, yeah, we worked. Do you go? Do they shoot stuff for you, like sample stuff for that R and D? No. So we, <laughs> or do you just use the intern? 
Yeah, like, that's right, it. Yeah. yeah. It like, all right, dance around in the corner. We'll figure it out later. Uh, yeah. No, they, they'd send us, uh, you know, anything that they had, but, you know, things were very much in pre-production for the most part. Um, so, you know, we get pre-production assets if they had them, you know, scans mm -hmm. if we had them. Um, but a lot of times we'd have to kind of make it up as we go along. Um, and really the whole point was to, to help them flesh out these moments or these technologies so that they can show an actor on set like mm -hmm. what what is going to happen because they, they don't have God, like a crazy uh, sand hologram right um and then right. to also show like the visual effects artists at you know ilm or method or any of these crazy studios that are actually doing you know the the rendering and the compositing and the creating of these things for the final shots mm -hmm. you know they would use uh presumably i don't know i wasn't there but like presumably they're using our conceptual development Right. to give mm -hmm. them a guide to follow that says like, okay, well, when she holds her hand out, the bead will roll out and it will form this sand hologram. Um, mm -hmm. And it should sort of look and behave kind of roughly like this. And it should have like an image projected on it. So it looks like a real thing, but the back should be like kind of sandy and wobbly and still feel like, like, uh, like you get a sense of that technology that's built mm -hmm. into it. Um, yeah, it was, it was a once in a lifetime experience it was it was really incredible that's awesome because yeah. there's there's like so many studios and when i'm watching a movie and i see at the end that like 10 different studios worked on something yeah. the first thing that goes through my mind is man how did they keep everything consistent <laughs> yeah you know so yeah. because it's so hard to do it's really hard to do so they're you know they're a well-oiled machine these days mm -hmm. um you know mm -hmm. so they have a, a very <clears throat> Uh, strict set of rules that uh, that every studio follows so that everything ends up in the same color space and ends up looking the same. Um, everything mm -hmm. is submitted in a way that uh, is easy for their kind of like ingestion system to take because they have, you know, you think about yeah. like when they're doing, when they're in full on post-production mode, they're looking at hundreds, if not thousands of shots of visual effects a day. Yeah, like yeah. they're just watching oh, over and over and over and over, and they have to review with studios and uh, and and VFX artists and everything. Like it's a it is a crazy, crazy undertaking. I can only imagine the the infrastructure that they must have in place to work as efficiently as they do. It's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. It really you, is. You don't necessarily, you're not going to have a 100% picture lock at any given time. Do you? Right. Do yeah. They give no. you, is it down to the frame or do you put padding on things or like? So we always, of, yeah, we always do uh, eight frames of head and tail. Mm -hmm. Usually they ask okay. for overscan. So, you know, if, if the movie's delivering at 2K, you render a little bit more than 2K. Uh, so that yeah, they can okay. kind of take it and, and repo and that kind Move of thing. Around. Uh, yeah. Always delivering EXRs. So they have like the full range cool. of color to work with. Um, the EXRs are always run through uh, a color pipe that they've built in the very beginning of the movie. Um, mm -hmm. and, and each one is different. So, you know, of course, working with that is, is always a little bit of a challenge, at least in the beginning, to like figure out how to work with whatever the specific show's color pipe is. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a massive undertaking and, you know, perception being a relatively small studio, especially compared to like ILM and method and yeah. MPC and all these huge monster behemoth studios, you know, we're, we're just a small blip on their radar, but they always, you know, they always kind of treated us with, uh, with an equal amount of respect when it came to you know, working working with such gargantuan studios on these huge projects. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. insane. And Billy was asking, and you answered some of this, but he was asking about, you know, the staging for these different phases, you know, pre-pro and R&D and all of that. Yes. Um, how do you even go about keeping track of all of this? Well, a lot of times what, you know, naming, naming an organization is incredibly important. Just, as a, as a, as a rule on any project, whether it's a giant feature mm -hmm. or like a commercial or just a personal project you're doing, 
like naming an organization is absolutely essential because it's going to ultimately it's going to save you when when you're in crunch time, when things are yeah. going really crazy and you've got one hour to do a whole day's worth of work and you're like, oh my God, yeah. where's that file? Like you don't want to spend all your time looking for the correct file. You want to know exactly where it is. So naming conventions are always really important. A lot of times what will happen is you'll have a different set of naming conventions for pre-production or pre than you will for the final picture. Okay. Um, you'll start with like a, a, a previs naming convention and everybody will work in that. So you understand like just without even opening the file, I can look at it and tell you, oh, that's a pre-production file or that's an animation test or that's a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a color sample or just a still <laughs> image or whatever it is, you know? Um, yeah, that, that level of organization was absolutely essential. And really, you know, it's, it's something that, that personally I think should be implemented no matter what you're doing, whether it's a, feature film or not um yeah stay organized because it'll save you it'll save you every time yeah now my question too is when in, in any of these studios really when you sit down to work on a shot like that are you doing everything from start to finish or are there people that do like just 3d tracking and just keying and I good, know, or is it a mix of both <laughs> yeah it's and it totally depends. A lot of times what they'll do is, you know, we'll work on a shot that has like a screen comped in, but there's mm -hmm. a whole like background of visual effects stuff going on that we aren't responsible for. <laughs> Set extensions mm -hmm. and, you uh -huh. know, uh, right. digital prosthetics and all kinds of like, it, it's, it's crazy. So a lot of times we do end up working with other studios and, and a lot of it, it, it kind of depends on what the needs are for that particular shot. Um, if all we're doing is screen graphics, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll send us, you know, whatever studio did the tracking, they'll send us all the tracking data or any LIDAR data cool. or mm -hmm. any, you know, uh, uh, digital assets that they have. We'll do like what we need to do for, um, for approval purposes and make sure that, you know, whatever screens we've got or whatever holograms there are, are doing uh, what they need to do and they're not being obscured by something important in the shot or whatever, that they're, that they're telling the story, that they're telling a story mm -hmm. effectively to, to everybody in a very clear way. And then we'll end up like submitting uh, assets to whatever studio and they'll do the final comp because they've got some like giant set in the background that they're doing or, you know, comping a city or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like they did that. We did it a lot with um, Thor Ragnarok when we were doing holograms for um for the ships and everything in the sakar chase scene uh, mm -hmm. obviously that entire city is like a huge visual effects uh scene and uh so what we would do is is just get the tracking data and just focus on the the tiny little component that we were doing and then send it all over to uh to the team doing the actual final shot and you know like comping the ship and all that stuff so um, but then there are some shots that we would do start to finish, you know, um, where they would just send us plates and we would do everything from soup to nuts. That was it. Were there any shots hmm. that uh, you were doing specifically for the movie that ended up just getting cut entirely? You're like, oh, I spent so much time on that. Yeah, that's always <laughs> it's always a danger. Um, but at the end of the day, you just sort of have to trust that the director is making those decisions, you know, for the betterment of the, the film and you just don't, mm -hmm. you know, you don't take it personally, but yeah, it's sometimes it's frustrating. You're like, Oh, that was so cool. And now it's gone. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, unfortunately those are the kinds of things that you probably will never be able to show and be like, well, yep. It hit the cutting room floor and then yeah. nobody wants to talk about it. So that's it. It's gone. Well, and even the things that you do work on that do make the movie, sometimes yeah. you're not allowed to show. You know, that's got to be a little bit frustrating because if that's all you're working on all of the time, yeah, you know, then and, you're like, oh, all this stuff I want to show. And that's that's kind of the thing with the tech work, you know, just in general as well. Mm -hmm. It's like that stuff will will never be able to show or talk about for the most part. Um, right. Because so much of it is is so much conceptual development that's like locked away in in a vault somewhere never to see the light of day and we've you know right signed our lives away on ndas and 
you know, can't ever talk yeah. about it. Can't show it. Can't claim it. It's, yeah. uh, well, but <laughs> it's, it's part of the well, game. Well, Matt and I did a, a project for Perception one time too. And it's like, yeah, man, that's right. Can never show it. We can never show it. It's, you know? uh, it's locked away in a vault somewhere. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's it. It's, it's what it is. It, it comes with some really interesting problems to solve though. And I think that's, that's so much the benefit of that kind of work is like you're working mm-hmm. directly with the people who are, you know, a lot of times you're working directly with the engineers, you're working with uh, executives, you're working with the people who are actually going to take this thing and try and make it for real in the real world. And it's, um, yeah. it's a fascinating process, man. It really is. It's, uh, and it, that kind of, that's sort of the trade off. Uh, like I may never be able to show or talk about any of that stuff, but like those experiences were really, really cool. Mm-hmm. So sorry, so I had you, a bit of an left- emergency there. I had to take care of. No, not at all. <laughs> I, I pulled a Dave and accidentally spilt soda all over my keyboard. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, you better get in there. It's yeah. not going to work like mine. Yeah, you're going to have to buy a soda. whole new one. <laughs> Is Sorry, that go good ahead. or bad? Does it make it worse? No, I think it's <laughs> fine because it's got no sugar in it. So, you know. It's I just I got know. a bunch of chemicals that'll corrode mm. it instead. Oh, that's it. Mm. Yeah. No big Delicious. deal. <laughs> um, okay, so it's 2020 and everybody, although, like, you know, like I say, I don't like to set goals based on the position of the Earth in space. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but a lot of people are setting <laughs> goals for yeah. this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you, you did your thing in New York. I feel like, yep. you know, it, it, it seems right. It seems like a good amount of time. You were there for a good chunk amount of time. You're, yep. you're moving your career forward by making this change. And so how do you kind of keep yourself going, keep yourself moving? And how do you evolve as an artist, that's, you know, when you're working big jobs like this? Yeah, that's, that's tough sometimes. Although Usually, I mean, just like you said, a lot of people like to make uh, sort of New Year's resolutions or whatever. I always, I'm not a big New Year's resolution guy because um, I almost feel like they're they're sort of made to be broken. Like that's the big joke is like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's your New Year's resolution. Yeah. That'll last about two weeks. You'll join that gym yeah. and then you'll never go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you'll pay for it for a year. That's how they make yeah. their money. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. But for me, the last the last several <laughs> years... I've tried to set myself not so much a specific goal, but more of like a broad topic of things to to focus on. And obviously, several years ago, one of those was Houdini. I, you know, mm-hmm. I beat my head against the wall trying to learn that program for several mm-hmm. times. And, you know, one year I just committed to it and I sat down and made it happen. Um, but... You know, because last year was so crazy with us getting married and like moving mm-hmm. and honeymoon and all that. I mean, everything was was nuts. I didn't really have a ton of time for personal development last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to now about being, you know, a little bit more settled out here on the West Coast. We've been here for a couple of months. Um, feeling pretty good about that. So I think it's... It's for me personally, it's about setting like a broad goal, like not mm-hmm. so much something like, you know, I have to put out X number of personal pieces this year or I want to work on this kind of project. It's really more about like a general direction that I want to grow in for the year. Um, and I think for me this year, I haven't I haven't fully nailed it down yet. Um but I do want to do more personal work. I haven't really done much of that the last couple of years because things have been so mm-hmm. busy. And mm-hmm. um, so I want to get more into doing some work for myself. Um, so that's that'll be a big focus for me this year, I think, regardless of what direction I end up sort of picking to, to grow in. Um, but that seems to work pretty well for me, at least like just the way that I work. I like to have mm-hmm. a little bit more wiggle room, a little less of like rigid boundaries. Yeah. How's your stress level since going freelance? Fantastic. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's certainly stressful to not have the guarantee of a paycheck sure. every, every couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm. but 
again, it's the kind of thing that I've done this before. Like I, I know how to kind of weather the storms of, uh, of slow times mm-hmm. in the freelance world. Mm-hmm. Um, and thus far, it seems like Los Angeles has a, just a ridiculous amount of work at the moment. It's good. Um, yeah. you know, a lot of people these <clears throat> days, a lot of the, the more experienced artists are actually jumping ship and heading to the tech sector. So Interesting. it's, mm-hmm. it's left this kind of like gap in capabilities in, in a lot of these spaces where it used to be like flooded with people who are, mm-hmm. you know, like there was more senior artists than you can, than you can count. And these days I feel like so many of those artists have gone in house, um, at big tech companies or startups or whatever, just because it's, you know, they pay well and it's very consistent mm-hmm. work. Yeah. Um, yeah. but for freelancers, I feel like it's, it's kind of a benefit in a way because it's, uh, it, it shrinks the pool, but the need is still there. Mm-hmm. Um, at least that's what I've noticed so far. Maybe other people have seen differently. Yeah. Are you working with anybody, any of our, our other MoGraph friends over there right now? Not at the moment. Um, I did... Let's see. I had drinks with Trevor Kerr a little while ago. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You guys know Trevor, I'm sure. Of course. Yeah. Um, I had. What about uh, Aaron Cover it? Have you seen him no. out there yet? No, I haven't. Yeah. No, not yet. Um, <laughs> Brandon Parvini. So, I love that guy. Yeah. Brandon's oh, yeah. great. He's my favorite. Yeah. yeah. He was. Matt's uh, man crush. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> He's great. Uh, he was actually yeah. really helpful when uh, when we were talking about moving out here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was he'd been you know he's been here forever. He's been here yeah. for a really long time. He has a really good sense of you know how freelance works in the city, what neighborhoods are you know fun to live in, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So he was he was a great kind of mind to pick when we were talking about where to live and you know what to do and all that fun stuff. So yeah, Brandon's Brandon's awesome. He's great. Cool man. Yeah. Now, um the um the next question here is um we at Camp Mograph this year, we were at um which I sadly missed. I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry we yeah. were hey, you got we were, this year. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, this year. Yeah, and it's uh it's West Coast this time, right? Like it's yes, uh, it it's is. out in my Portland, neck Oregon. Place. Yes. From LA, place. it's like a $180 round trip. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, mm-hmm. man. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry I had to miss it. We were, <laughs> we were yeah, deep yeah, in the middle yeah. of shaking <laughs> our life up at the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, sorry. Not sorry to interrupt. But no, you're you, fine. You could, take a, you could take a car up the coast. Yeah, there. dude. Yep. Take an RV take up, there. up there. Yeah, now we're talking. Yeah. Rent an RV for, yeah. uh, for a week, drive it up, drive it back. Amazing. Yeah. That'd be cool. There's a place yeah. to park an RV. Yeah. I don't know if there's an RV hookup, though. Yeah, that's okay. I could yeah, find one. I can find out for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the the thing is that there was a lot of talk after Camp Mograph about like inspirations that come from external sources because yeah. that's mm-hmm. really kind of all we did at Camp Mograph is just unplug and and do other things and and I feel like you know even myself and and other people that I see posting on the the Camp Alumni Facebook page you know I mean like look at what Mark thornson did you know we'll we'll have to uh we're gonna do a little contest here pretty soon with that too we need (laughs) to mention that um i need to write that down so i don't forget about that but i had no idea um, we were doing a contest but cool (laughs) yeah yeah we were talking about doing a little contest thing um but the the thing is like everybody came back and was posting things about how they got inspiration by being away from the Mm -hmm. computer yeah you know Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, that just seems you, like just it's something being away that for a little bit gives right you a now. chance, even though you're you're still, you know, talking to people about the industry or doing things that are semi related to the industry, just getting away and doing something completely different. It's like being on a project for yeah. a year Absolutely. and then stepping away yeah. and doing a very simple explainer video. You yeah. know, it like gives you a chance <laughs> to just kind of clear your head and then jump back in. Recharge the creative mm. batteries a little bit. That's super Absolutely. important, man. And we, you know, I feel like everybody in this, in, in the, the industry sort of hits these points where they're just grinding really hard. We've all hit those points where just things are just super intense. You can't step away. And after those are done, I don't know about you guys, but I always kind of feel this like, 
what do I do now? Now that I'm not working on this project for, you know, 17 hours a day, what do I yeah. do with myself? Like, how did I, what was yeah. my life before this thing? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I feel like those are the times when it's really important to, to step away and not look at a glowing rectangle for a while. Yeah. And, yeah. and to, you know, or at least look at some things that aren't, motion graphics related right yeah like like i love looking at you know i love watching movies and tv and mm -hmm. and things like that but you know get a go to an art museum go um i don't know go see live theater if that's something yeah, that you have yeah. available to you um go see a comedy show you know go go see go something watch cats right yeah cats <laughs> yeah, that movie is supposed geez. to be insane yeah it's supposed to be nuts oh man <laughs> we should we should have a conversation. Actually, can we can we do that real quick? Can we sure, do some links? I have this in my links, and you know, I, the one thing that I don't like about articles these days online so is there's just there's no content, and it's all ads in like two paragraphs. Yeah. And, but this one article was it, it's Cats VFX team explains what went wrong with the movie. Oh, Russ, I'm sure you I heard thought you about. Were gonna, I all thought you were going to link to the article about the guy who took a bunch of mushrooms and then went and saw cats. Because <laughs> that oh, one was I a pretty fun article. That. Yeah. Oh man, nope. That sounds like a <laughs> recipe funny. for nightmares. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, the it's funny because this this I think is the first time that a at least a major public release has been like patched after yeah. it was released yeah, yeah 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 super weird like they they sent out like redone improved visual effects uh yeah and from yeah. what i saw they didn't look any good <laughs> Oh really? <laughs> oh yeah, no. Have you seen there's there was a gif going around that was um a moment where I I don't even know what insanity was taking place, but there were a bunch of cockroaches with faces okay. and it looked yeah. abysmal. <laughs> it just didn't like it looked like a like a weird fever dream, you know? Like and it kind of honestly, it kind of made me want to see the movie. I know all these people are talking <laughs> yeah. about how, you know, terrible it is or how the vfx is like rough you know and it's like okay now i, I want to see what the what it's all about yeah. i mean is it I'm gonna not, be one yeah. of those things where it's like a tradition to go watch it you know and yeah and make fun of it what's the movie that everybody goes to see the the you know what i'm talking about right <laughs> oh you're talking uh, about like the room like rocky oh yeah or the rocky room, horror picture rocky, show no, rocky yeah. horror picture yeah. show yeah 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 well and the it, room yeah so oh. Yeah. Rocky Horror is a little different just because it's not so much that it's a it's not a bad movie essentially. It's right. very participatory and I think that's what right. people get really into. The Room is is ostensibly a bad movie. Oh, it's but awful. It's, <laughs> yeah. But it's so bad that you kind of have to watch it. It's kind of like uh like Troll 2, you know? Uh -huh. Like it sort of fits into that that realm. And yeah. you know, just just touching back on cats really quick, you know, it's it may not necessarily be the visual effects artists that were, you know, it's not like they hired sure. a bunch right. of yeah, yeah, yeah. a bunch of goobers that didn't know how to do it. I mean, incredibly talented people worked on that movie. Yeah. But yeah. likely yeah. under very difficult circumstances, uh, yeah. you know, for for whatever reason. Uh so, you know, we can't we can't necessarily cast the blame on them for yeah for how I'm rough sure things it wasn't look. just like a handful of VFX people working on yeah. this show. I'm sure it was yeah. a whole yeah. team, an entire army and that's of why, people. Yeah, that's why I feel like you're such a great person to talk to about this because you're just you've been in that pipeline before, mm -hmm. you know. And it's yeah. It's, yeah and actually, the, speaking of that, have you ever seen shots up from the Marvel movies where you're just like, oh man, you know, like that other teams have done. Or maybe not Marvel, <laughs> maybe some of the other movies where you're like, oh, I feel like we could have done that a lot better. Well, I mean, when you see something, when we're in this kind of like super tight niche that that we are, there's always a bit of like, 
kind of comparison, right? Like you always look uh-huh. at something and say, oh man, that's really cool. I, I wish I had thought of that or like, wow, crap, I could have done that a whole lot better than, uh, than what they yeah. did. But the, the thing is when you go and see a movie, all you're seeing is the end result. You're not seeing right. any of the process. You're not seeing any of the back and forth. Maybe yeah. the director didn't give a shit that that looked stupid. Maybe, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe there was a producer on the movie that like, made a bad call and sent you down a weird direction. And then, I mean, these kind of things happen. Like there's so many people involved and it's, it's, I think as a viewer, it's easy to look at it in a vacuum and say, well, that looked dumb. That looked terrible. But like, you don't know (laughs) what conversations or what circumstances, like that could have been a shot that somebody dropped on. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, well, (laughs) you know, you paid us, you know, a third of what we're used to be getting paid, you get what you pay for. Or like, you Mm -hmm. know, you gave us that shot with two days to do a month's worth of work. What do you expect? Like, there's only so much you can do um, with what you're given and and circumstances. You know, I mean, it could be that that there were, you know, internal issues or uh, there's there's all kinds of things that happen behind the scenes that that you don't see when you mm-hmm. go see the final product. And so yeah. I always, you know, as as rough as some visual effects can look, and certainly from what I understand, Cats looks super rough, mm-hmm. you kind of have to, you have to be a little forgiving with all the people who were involved in that because there were so many people and uh, and they're working with, with the best that they, the best that they can do, you know? Yeah. Uh, with what yeah. they're given. How'd you feel about that the first Sonic that trailer? <laughs> oh jeez. Uh. Well before you before you hit that though, um the the thing that I heard about cats is and, and this is a whole video game mentality, right? We'll just kind of put it out there and then we'll fix it later. Yeah. They were you know, the fact that they were sending shots and new versions back to the theater, it's like if if you the way you would know is if you were watching in the theater and some of the cats still had their human hands. <laughs> Right. That's how you would know if you were yeah. on the original version of it or the finalized version of it. Oh, really? And to yeah. me, that sounds like a top-down thing. Yeah, I mean, they would just yeah. be standing there in just regular hands, you know? And it's like, that sounds top-down. That sounds like a management thing. It sounds like right. they were rushing it out because they want to get right. consideration for 2019 awards. It's mm-hmm. like, just slow down and do it right. right. Well, I think a lot of the problem, too, specifically with feature films, is once you set a release date, and from what I understand, I'd, I'd, and to be clear, I don't know a great deal about this process, but just getting a date for national release is like a whole industry in itself, right? Because you're, you're mm-hmm. up against major, major studios who are all jockeying for you know that top spot. Um, and you see a lot of times when when release dates tend to change by a week or two or whatever here mm-hmm. and there, sometimes it's because there's another big release that, you know, your multi-million dollar movie, you don't want to be up against another studio's multi-million dollar movie. Right. You want to have that like week or two of gap where you are the only show in town and everybody's talking about your movie before the next big mm-hmm. thing comes out. Right. So, so much of the time, like you have a very hard deadline. Like this movie comes out this day and that is it. Like not budging, nothing is happening to change that. Like mm-hmm. whatever we have done at that time is what the public sees. And that's yeah. You know, that's that's kind of the thing that everybody is working against. You know, mm-hmm. when you're working on a commercial, sometimes depending on like if it's, you know, if it's going in front of the Super Bowl, obviously you have a pretty hard deadline, but like sometimes you can push it a week or two and like some people get a little huffy about it, but whatever, like that happens, Yeah, you know, just due to decision making processes or whatever. But like with a feature film, you yeah. can't like, that's it. Your, your, your deadline is fixed mm-hmm. uh, for the most part. So the fact that they released a product and then released a patch was super (laughs) super weird and i'm there's part of me that's a little concerned about that precedent being established i know exactly totally exactly it's kind of a dangerous door to open um Mm -hmm. i and it i would the one thing that worries me about going down this path is it, it it goes back to the original star wars trilogy 
you know, yeah. when George Lucas made all his, his updates and re-released them in yeah. the theater, you know, when we were in middle school or high school or elementary school or yeah. whatever, you know, when he re-released them at no point now, unless you find an old VHS, you know, or the laser disc of the original movie, yeah, can you torrent. see George Lucas's <laughs> or original torrent. version of the movie yeah, as right. it was originally done? You right. know, you go on to Disney Plus, it's like, nope, you get the updated version. Of course. You know? And it's like, yeah. that's not what I want to see. Mm-hmm. I want to see yeah. the original version. And it, it's kind of it's kind of sucky because with cats. I want to see the crappy version. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to see the updates, you know? Yeah. I want to, if they had kept the ver- the bad version there, maybe it would become some sort of B movie, you know, or like it would become <laughs> a, a, a hit just by its meme ability. Yeah, you know? exactly. I, I mean, uh, I also think <clears throat> about, um, you know, I mean, maybe it'll be like a DVD extra or maybe it'll be like a like a parallel release or something like that. It also depends, I guess, on like how many shots they really change. Did they change a handful because they just yeah. couldn't get them done? Or did they like drastically unilaterally change a whole bunch of stuff? It it makes right. me think of like, um, you know, the the latest Mad Max movie, which was just amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, it, they had said that when they were watching it so there's when they're scoring a movie like that they'll have a kind of a like a rough cut like black and white version without any audio that they use to actually score the movie Mm -hmm. and that's what's projecting up in the you know in the the orchestra chamber or wherever they're actually doing the recording uh and so the you know the conductor is working uh to the picture so that they can get like the right swells and and the right kind of down notes. They can have that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Well, when they were making that, that was actually like the director's favorite version of the movie. From what I understand, like totally silent black and white, like really stripped back. And, um, I always found that super interesting. They, they actually did release a, um, I think they called it black and chrome version of the movie that uh, mm-hmm. that I bought which honestly I was a little disappointed in <laughs> um, just because they it didn't seem like they bothered to do anything other than just remove the color which is kind of uh-huh. a bummer because you have like so much of that movie is about these moments where you have like the red flame in front of this blue sky and when yeah. you take all the color mm-hmm. out of it you don't see that anymore because the values are very similar so it just ends up being kind of a mush like they didn't it didn't seem like they put a great deal of time and energy i I don't know maybe they did Uh, but it seemed like it seemed like it could have been pushed a little further in in the realm of color to make it a little bit more interesting personally for sure yeah you'd never know if those are going to be on point like for example i actually prefer the director's cut of donnie darko yeah. Because it makes a little bit more sense. You know, they explain a couple more things that yep. you're like, wait, what is going on? You never know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Maybe I didn't like see Bill that version because I didn't understand it. No? Uh, well, know. yeah, the director's cut, it actually has some scenes in it where you're like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense now. You know, hmm. I, I now I understand what they were getting at because it's a good movie. It's amazing. It, it, I love it. it it makes you want just a little bit more, though. I wanted a little bit more out of Donnie Dargo. Uh, what Billy was saying, though, in the chat was that the internet is working to restore the original version of mm-hmm. Star, Star Wars, Wars as close to the current Blu-ray version as possible. Getting oh, all these awesome. clips, people restoring them and stuff. And yeah, uh, see, but the thing is, like, if the original version had been updated in the or in the middle of you know the 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 product or the, in the middle the middle of like being out in the theater we never get to see that original cut right exactly you know? right exactly so, uh yeah. there is the despecialized versions of the original trilogy that uh that exist that have um some of those shots removed uh the, but i don't know mm-hmm. the thing about that so like oh. they released uh uh episode four five six on like DVD or Blu-ray or something and then had the despecialized versions, but they were just uh like uh, uh rips of the laser disc right. that still yeah. had it in four three let with letterbox. So oh, if you're watching yeah, yeah. it on a 
you know, a 16 by 9 TV, you get <laughs> letterbox pillar box Oof. at the same time. And it's like, ugh, gross. <laughs> and there's a version out there online, too, uh, where Jar Jar has been removed from the movie completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is great. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jar Jar Mac, uh, what's up, Mac? Uh, in the in the Facebook chat oh. there, he says um, he he was mentioning when Spielberg replaced the guns and ET with walkie talkies. But st- the good thing though is that Spielberg did come back and reverse that. I I think that he was like, you know what, you all know what I'm talking about. I don't know. I don't remember that. So there's there's a scene in ET where they're all on their bikes. No spoilers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <But they're, laughs> oh man, I haven't seen all, ET. They ride bikes. Yeah. Oh. I haven't seen it yet. And tell me what happens. It's they're going down the street and they're coming up on all these cop cars that have a blockade and all of the cops are holding like shotguns in their hands. You know, it was the seventies. Nobody cared. And then they came out with a new version later and they replaced digitally all the shotguns with walkie talkies. With all the but then Spielberg actually came back around in the end and uh when they did like the new whatever remastered blu-ray version he actually put it back to the original he's like no we're not gonna do that yeah let's just go back to the original it was the it was a 2002 edition where they replaced it well they replaced a whole lot of stuff yeah i I just looked up et shotguns walkie talkies on youtube and they actually (laughs) did a whole bunch of like cgi et's as well Weird. I think somebody did a spoof at one point where they replaced lots of things in different movies with Man, I, I hate that they're like I really wish they would they would go back to some more puppetry stuff. You know? Yeah. Like so, yeah. Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda is yeah. awesome. And Baby Yoda is amazing. You know? Yeah. I think yeah. for me, you know, one of the one of my favorite visual effects movies of all time is The Thing. And it Uh was done in like 1981 or it came out in 1981. It was probably being Mm -hmm. worked on in the, in the late seventies, but man, the, the visual effects in that movie are just insane and they're so gross and nasty. And I don't, I don't know if there is any truth to the rumor that the prequel that they did, which was also weirdly called the thing, which doesn't make any sense, Uh but like they, they did like a prequel movie in the mid two thousands. And the rumor was that they had actually shot the entire thing with practical effects sort of in the style of the original movie. And that then later they had replaced all that with CGI and the CGI did not look spectacular because it was, yeah, it was the mid 2000s. Things were a little rough around the edges still, Uh but I would have found Mm -hmm. it so much more compelling if they had kept the original like puppets and things like on set that they were working with. Like, is that so much of that particular film's aesthetic? Yeah. Um, but I love that stuff, you know, like the original Alien and Aliens movies, like all that stuff. It was Alien 3 when they started using CG aliens that just looked terrible, it just did not look good. Like it just wasn't there yet, um, mm-hmm. you know, but the yeah, with you on the puppet thing. Have you all seen Billy's- the uh, the short film I'm Here by Spike Jones? Mm, no, no, it's so good. It's about this like computer esque like these humanoid computers and stuff like that and um they do something similar that they do on um where the wild things are you yeah. know where it's like cgi like eye blinks and stuff like that but incorporating you know practical mm. stuff with cgi and it just yeah. looks so so real you know yeah. it feels real yeah because most know. of the time like, it is that's amazing yeah. it's uh yeah i, I think that's you know that's where things get very compelling visually is when you're when you're working with a practical asset but then you're supplementing it with a little bit of CGI i think that's you know when it's done tastefully i think that's that's really cool and where yeah. the wild things are is great that's a good example yeah. of that it was a weird really said but, that uh, you know. <laughs> i guess the people who are putting together the the recreations of some of these movies are using things like you know ai upscaling and all yeah. these new technologies to to restore it themselves. That's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, other couple of links I had real quick. One of them was, um, I haven't even been able to dig into the article cause I just saw it the other day. I think Ari posted it online and it's, 
uh, a, a lighting artist from a 3D film, a 3D fi- feature film, kind of shows and explains how important lighting is in yes, 3D films. I saw this. That? This was yeah, awesome. Yeah. Actually, yep. so the the movie that he's showing off is Spies in Disguise. Yep. You know, it, it, as as dumb as it sounds, a pigeon movie <laughs> with Will Smith. Yeah. It was so good. So, I really liked it. I actually have a, a buddy of mine named uh, John Coltai. He did a lot of work with us at Perception. He did all of the holograms and screen graphics and design in that movie. So, Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great movie. I really enjoyed it. It's awesome. I'm going to have to uh, see it. Me, my wife, and my kid went and saw it like this past weekend or something. And my kid has been, he's been watching the trailer. He watches these trailers over and over and over again. So he knows all these movies. He knows all the stupid lines, you know, and we go and see it. And it was, it was a very enjoyable movie. But yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, They have all these before and afters, which are really great. You know, I guess they kind of light it pretty flat to start out, and yeah, yeah I mean, comes in but look really at like, like look at it. like some of the the daylight versus the the or like go up to the where the car is. Mm-hmm. I mean, look oh, at yeah, that. That's like you just flat. showing like yeah. a, a a night lighting a nighttime scene and stuff like yeah. that. That's so rad. It's really cool, yeah. and that's you know, it, it just goes to show like with these features, there's so many people that touch each single shot. Uh-huh. You know. Like all the people that do the animation, like everything is very bucketed out. Like it's, it follows a very, you know, at least a lot of the times it follows a very kind of rigid pipeline from, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, character animation and rigging and simulation and animation, lighting and compositing and all that stuff. And you have, you know, different departments that are handling all of these things, sort of assembly line style. And it's, it, it, it's never down to just one person who's who's handling the whole thing. It's a it's a massive team. So, you know, you see these things, whether they're like good or bad, you know, there's possibly fifty or a hundred people that touched a shot, whether or not they were producers or um, you know, they were working on the shot themselves. You know, there's tons of people that that make these things come to life. It's uh really cool. Yeah. Dave, I sent you another link for once we get to links. Unless oh, we're you already did? there. Well, yeah. we're in links. Okay. We're, we're, oh, in the uh, I don't know if you have this in there, but it's it's an uh someone posted it in the Slack and it's so super oh, okay. cool. I don't know if you can bring right. it up. Um Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what but, I'm so at it now. it's called Still File. It's a series of four photographs recreating 3D renders. So as you scroll down, these are all actually photographs that they took in order to make it look like 3D renders. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's crazy is there's the the one with the teapots. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. They're all really beautiful. But the one with the teapots reminds me of an artist that I saw. And forgive me, I do not remember the name of the artist. But he he creates these these sculptures just like this, but with like like real world objects that you can walk around in a room. The one that really screwed me up was the telephone booth. So like you walk into a room and the only thing in the room is a like an old school like telephone booth. But uh-huh. it's like it looks like you took it and like stretched it and skewed it in 3D space. Uh huh. And it is so dizzying like as soon as you walk in that room like you kind of get unstable because it like (laughs) really messes with your sense of perspective and reality Uh but he had like he had a bunch of skulls that he took and and did these kind of like stretching and warping things he had like a uh, like a pistol that he took and and did and like an old telephone and chairs and things like that but the the phone booth was the one that really screwed me up because it was the only thing in the room and you go in and this thing is like so distorted but it's real and you can walk around it and you're like I've, uh, I don't even know if I can be in this room and yeah. and not feel like I'm <clears throat> dizzy like it was it's it's nuts man it's so cool but that stuff yeah. that stuff is amazing I love that yeah yeah that's super neat. I love the the second one, the floating colored cube. Yeah, because they added like a gray dated, like a, a poorly, like a, an eight bit gray dated, you know, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's neat. Yeah, that's the gradient awesome. banding in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah the banding. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude, that's so cool. These are awesome. Yeah, yeah. Also, breaking news oh, right breaking. now. 
Yeah, I just this just came down the 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 pipe as an in text form from EJ. Oh yeah, guess, did you see uh, the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I guess Merck. Everybody was kind of wondering what happened to Merck. Yeah, yeah. Kind of so fell off the somebody radar. wrote something. Yeah, yeah. It, somebody wrote something online and said, "Hey, you know what? What happened? Is he okay? Blah blah blah." And then he replied with a video. Yeah, and he it like, looks like he got like, in an accident. Yeah, like busted up his arm and his hand, and like he's mm. healing from stitches or something like that. Like, look like he could. I'm barely guessing even he's left handed. Yeah. I don't know, yeah, you crazy. can't move his hand. That sucks. Oof. That sucks. So, well, Merck, we wish you the best. Thoughts Feel better, prayers. please. I didn't know. I didn't know AI could could injure right? the hands, but <laughs> apparently so. <clears throat> Man, um, the the last thing, the last link that I have here was the one on the Verge this week, uh, Beeple article. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah. awesome. Oh, motorcycle um, accident is what Billy motorcycle. Says. Yeah, that's Jeez. what it looked like on the man. Ouch. Um, yeah, there's a whole Verge article on Beeple, so we'll put post that in the show notes as well. And um, so on that note, I think we should probably go to Beeple's people. Beeple's people, where do you get the Beeple? Beeple's people, what's up with the guy? Let's do it. All right. This is the first time I get to say this. Get out of your Beeple viewer of choice. Mine's going to be Twitter. And go to January 2nd, Year Overlord 2020. Oh, snap. First time I get to say that. January 2nd. This is... It's called 2019 Problems. And I kind of like this. I'm going to bring it up here so you can see. This is... Um, oh, I loved it's, this it's, one. I thought this it's, was beautiful. It's like 2019 Problems in 2020. It's like you're... you're problems from last year following you oh. or maybe you're getting rid of them i don't know yeah One of the two and uh, uh it's really pretty it's, it's got, very uh, pretty i love the canted angle i love the the uh the i love the uh, the composition you know that feel big like it's one got is just that, looming i feel like it's got the the golden spiral you know i can i, I can see yeah, that a little it? bit you know all right you know going out to the big the big guy or whatever yeah, I, I can know. kind of see that. Uh, uh, and the colors, the color, the colors, children, the colors, the children. Hi, <laughs> enjoy it on as many levels as I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a really great one. I, I don't know if this has deeper meaning for him. Probably not. <laughs> but uh, that's a good one. And then the next one is January third. War Machine Wet Dream, and I'm assuming that this is because of the Trump-Iran situation right now. Yes, it, 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 it probably it, that's why. the day that he posted it. Yeah, I think Stupid that was Trump. when it first kind of... <laughs> feel the bab, and, uh, everyone, feel the bab, Paul feel Bab 2020. Bab. Paul Bab 2020. There you go. There you go. Uh, More now than ever. Yep. Yeah, what are we going to do after 2020? Paul Bab 2024. If he doesn't win. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, he'll win. Though. He'll <laughs> win. I mean, come, come on. on Paul, like, has grit. Everybody loves I, Paul. I am yeah. so sure of it, I'm not going to vote. <laughs> yeah, good idea. I'm sure that'll work out fine. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is really great. Mech Warrior Trump. All the little troops on the bottom. I'm trying to see if there are any Easter eggs or anything in here. Um, I was I curious if he, gets... he was gonna, if like starting in 2020, if he was gonna move away from that type of stuff, but it doesn't seem like it. Actually, know? that's a that's a good question. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if he has the same uh, fiscal year, so to speak, when it comes right. to his <laughs> art. <laughs> I think he may <clears throat> do those transitions when he hits his year marker. Rather, oh, than you know what? The year. No, I bet you if you if you look at yesterday's, I think he's going. He's got a new target. Like is it I don't, dying, I don't, dying maybe. star. Is that yesterday? That's, no, that's, that's the next dying one. star is beautiful. Uh, you talking about pretty. kids after nine p.m.? Yeah. Well, that See, still kind of has the look. This whole yes, like, but um, he's going light, against like Gogurt light. now instead of Hot Pockets. Oh, that's new. Yeah, right. But he's still doing the whole pig thing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You go back to Dying Star, that one was really good. 
Yeah, he Dying actually Star... used a baby fetus in a in a good way instead of right a people way. <laughs> a people way. <laughs> This one <clears throat> feels like it comes back a little bit to the, I don't know, 20, 2016 Beeple, 2017 Beeple. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. With the kind of, you feel like there's an ongoing story here, some explorers looking for something, you know. Yeah. Maybe they found that somewhere or something. <clears throat> but um, the painted look, he's been putting the painted look on everything. I don't know if it's just that one filter... Uh, program. Yeah, I think that, it's just the filter program. What is it called again? I I bought I it. Remember. I don't even remember what it's called. Um, <laughs> uh, it it is a cool filter program. Just the interface is a little wonky. Yeah, but um, there's one yeah, called I, Alien Skin. Is that that one? It's not that one. Yeah. No, it's uh, yeah. I don't remember. He does a weird mix though, because like I don't think the background has the same painted effect, or you or these uh, stars I, I, I think would does. get a little muddy. Don't yeah. you think these stars would get muddy if you started putting all that on there? Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, I, yeah, I really like that one. Meaning-wise, I don't know. Dying Star, I'm not sure what, what that means. You know? know. Topaz, that be that's a it. Tough one. Thank you, Topaz, Steven. yeah. That's it. No, but that's really good. I'm waiting for the movie. The Beeple's People movie. <laughs> I guess you, I guess I've got it, it written in my book. head. There needs to be a book first. I have a fun little story in my head, but I don't think I'll ever have time to write it down. Right. <laughs> we'll do that after we uh yeah. After we launch this course. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No, then I got to get back on the tutorials. See, right? I have a whole I have two different <clears throat> tutorial series planned. So, got a whole um, backlog, man. Yeah. Oh, I got a backlog for years that I've been working on <laughs> my. I bet. You should see my notes over here. I I have like tutorial ideas from like the last three years. Yeah. So, uh, sure, half of them aren't even applicable anymore. Uh, so okay, we're gonna do a thing now called MoGraph recommends. Yeah. And this is where we we talk to you about your favorite stuff and things. Fantastic. And <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. And before before we start this, though, I would like to ask one question that I forgot to ask earlier, which Please is, do. what has been your favorite movie to work on so far? Oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. So certainly my favorite experience was Black Panther, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, my dog mm-hmm. is no, hearing somebody right. outside. So uh, if you hear her uh, all good. barking or whining, she's, she's calming herself down. She's okay. Um <laughs> Certainly my favorite experience was, was Black Panther. Um, and I, mm. I, think, I think that's probably also going to be the one that I say is my favorite one that I've worked on. Um, I, and, and so much of that, of course, is colored by, by my experience, but I think just kind of where that movie sits uh, in the MCU, but also just mm-hmm. kind of culturally, I think it was, it was just, it struck a really, really good note. <laughs> Uh, really enjoyed that one. Mm-hmm. Cool. All was right, that the well, longest one y'all worked on? The longest time we'd spent working on one, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because of all the R and D, especially, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and we did, you know, we did all the pre production, and then we also did like the title sequence at the end of the movie, and then we did um, a bunch of conceptual, you know, and developmental animation previs stuff for the prologue at the beginning of the movie. And that was weeks and weeks and weeks of work as well. So lots of, lots of work done on there. Uh, Thor Ragnarok kind of falls into that category as well, where you spent mm-hmm. a bunch of time doing development, but then ended up doing shots and the title sequence and all that. Fun stuff. I love Ragnarok. It was, a that fun was such movie. a fun movie. <laughs> it really was. It was a fun one. Really I enjoyed think the, that one. What's, what's the director's name? Taika Waititi. Taiko with yeah. yeah. I always I he did the uh are you up to date on the Mandalorian? Yes. Yep, we finished it this week. He did he did that he directed the last episode. Yep. And you can mm-hmm. absolutely tell, <laughs> yeah. you know, that is definitely yep. you know yeah. the banter at the beginning yeah. with yeah. Jason Sudeikis. That's hilarious. So good. Um very good. All right, so now we know your favorite one to work on, but what's your favorite one to watch? What's your favorite Man. movie in general? So that's it's a really hard question. Can I give you a few that I love? Sure, sure, okay. yeah. Nope, sorry, it has to be only one. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I'm a big <laughs> like the 
the ones that I really love to watch over and over, I never get sick of Aliens, uh, The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China. I'm a big I'm a big John Carpenter fan. Like I love I love mm-hmm. John Carpenter. Um, I also really love like James Cameron's movies. You know, T two and uh, and mm-hmm. Aliens and yeah. um, uh, True Lies. I think is just like like if yeah. there had to be a perfect or a near perfect action movie, it's True Lies. Like it's yeah. so good. It's yeah. so good. Uh so I think those, you know, those those hit the right notes. Recently, I think um like I really enjoyed Midsummer. Uh mm-hmm. really enjoyed Parasite. Parasite was so mm-hmm. good. I haven't um, seen that. I've heard a lot of good things. It was great. Yeah. It was it's a really, really good movie. Uh but yeah, yeah, that's those are my favorites, uh, at least at the moment. And what about T V show? Oh, yeah. So recently my favorite tv show that i've seen was the mandalorian i just i really enjoyed the mandalorian it felt so kind of like tonally on track with star wars i love this sort of like space western thing that um yeah that they were doing Uh, you know it kind of it it struck a little bit of like a serenity kind of vibe yeah with the space western that's what i said from the very beginning it felt very much like firefly yeah the music but it also felt like it had that that original story feel from yes. yeah. the eighties. Yeah. You know, exactly. And mm. I, you know, a lot of that we, so we actually went and saw the rise of Skywalker yesterday. No spoilers. So, I haven't seen yeah. it yet. I'm going to go watch, watch it this week, <laughs> but I, I will, I will tell you the thing about the modern star Wars movies that, mm-hmm. that I think sort of takes it a little bit away for, for me at least, from the feel of the original Star Wars movies, is that, you know, you have so many of these big CG set pieces. You have yeah. so many big CG shots or just entirely CG, and you can literally do anything with the camera. And they do. They sweep the camera around in, like, really impossible angles and and follow things that you could never follow in real life. And I think there's something in that that gets it away from the original look of the movies where everything was like very mechanical. Like you could only do Mm -hmm. so many different types of shots with the physical limitations that they have. And I feel like the Mandalorian does a good job of treating the camera as a real piece as opposed to just like, you know, I'm sure there are shots in the Mandalorian that are entirely CG. Yeah. Um, and they could have swept the camera around and done crazy camera moves, but they didn't for the most part. At least I can't remember it at, at any point them doing that. Yeah. And I think so much of, you know, of course, the sets always look like they were designed, you know, to fit in the universe. Like they're really good at the set design. They're really good at nailing the costumes and the look and the characters and uh, and everything. But I think that that camera, it has so much to to do like that it it communicates so much the way you move that camera and i think the mandalorian handled that really well yeah they had a really good i felt like they they really balanced the 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 cg ness of it you know it wasn't it wasn't overblown it felt great yeah it was great yeah i loved it um yeah so i take back anything that i said (laughs) after episode five and six or whatever yeah yeah. 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 It, Five and six. I was like, I wasn't sure, but yeah. it came back. Man. It's so good. <laughs> it did. So good. Yeah. So, okay, when you were at uh Perception, were you able to sit there and jam out music while you were working? Because it was kind of an open environment, right? Did you have to like leave your headphones off or were you able to just kind of dig into Y'all thoughts weren't even sometimes? Y- were y'all y'all weren't connected to the internet, right? No. No, yeah. that's that's always the hard oh, part geez. is like because of the security, mm-hmm. you can't be connected to the internet. Yeah. Um right. it's it's a very challenging. Were you able to have cell phones no, there as well? No, you're not supposed wow. to. Not supposed to. Um, so if you want to listen to music, you had to have like MP3 files or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did anyone have like old iPods that they were bringing with them? Oh man, no. That would be that would be amazing. No, a lot of times uh, there was no, you know, there's no music in the environment when we're when we're working on those things. You know, yeah. in the past, mm-hmm. you know, when when we weren't working on super high security things, we'd we'd all share like a 
um, a Spotify playlist and and that kind of thing where mm-hmm. everybody would dump a whole bunch of things into the Spotify playlist. And we'd have some music music going in the studio, but uh, you know, certainly not for uh, for any of those high security features. Yeah. Wow. So Man, that's when tough. you do get to listen, I have done to music, that though, before. And working in an environment where you can't have yeah. your cell phone, yeah. you can't have yeah. be connected to the internet. Yeah. Like you, you, you feel like a like a caveman. You it's know, crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, absolutely. You realize just how much you use the internet every day when yeah. you can't use the internet. Yeah, yeah. It's hard. It's really Insane. hard. Really so hard. So when you can listen to music, though, what do you listen yeah. to? You know, it's it's and this is something that I that I think about a lot because over the years, you know, certainly as as I've grown older, my relationship to music has changed a lot. But just the way that we consume music, you know, because like I grew up in like the 80s and 90s where going to the record store was like an event and it was exciting. And I would like, you know, come home with like a CD or two and I would just like throw it on. I'd listen to the whole thing and I would just like zone out reading liner notes and just like. Just sort of mm-hmm. taking it all in, like as a whole, or going to different CD shops in different cities yeah. and trying to find like the local music there that yes. was cool, you know, or like the rare import that like you right, heard of right, in a right. magazine, and you're like, oh man, I really want to listen to that, but like yeah. I can only get it in the UK, and it costs you know yep. two hundred dollars to <laughs> to get it over here, and uh, you know most record stores are going to laugh at you, and you want to try and right. get that kind of. And you're like, yeah, there's no way you're getting that. Um, <laughs> So there was so much of this, there was like a, um, like kind of a treasure hunt kind of feel to mm-hmm. music when, you know, certainly, certainly when I was growing up and, and over the years, of course, the way that we consume music has changed so much and, and my relationship to music has changed so much. And it's these days I listen to music based on like what kind of mood I'm in or what I'm doing at the time. Um, and so it's, it's very, so dramatically. Uh, so can I give you an answer for live shows? Yeah, because I love yeah, yeah. I love going to live shows. I think my my favorite live show I've ever seen was um, uh, let's see, the Flaming Lips was probably okay. my favorite live show. They just put mm-hmm. on the, the most insane spectacle. Mm-hmm. Like it was it was like being at somebody's like crazy birthday party on acid it was just <laughs> nuts yeah. nuts uh and they they actually stopped the show in the middle of in the middle of their set and they had like a card that this lady this lady was turning i think she was turning like 63 or something she's like huge fan she sent them a card saying you know i'll be in the in the audience since my 63rd birthday or whatever and they stopped the entire sold out show and had everybody in the audience sing happy birthday to this lady. They was like, Oh, that's really sweet. Oh, it was nice. super, super cool. And like, man, it was just, it was an amazing experience. It was one of those things like, I've, you know, I've been to tons of shows, but like, that's one that, that I really remember, you know? Uh, and and then, it's always great when you find out that a band or a star or someone is very, very yeah. down to earth and cool. Yeah. And just you like, know just cool about that kind of stuff they're not they're not uh they, and they they've been around heads, forever yeah. yeah they've been around for so long uh done so many shows and i'm sure it's you know for them it's a it's an opportunity to do something a little different a little something special yeah that was my favorite live show yeah cool now what about podcasts do you listen to any of them i do yeah uh especially now uh, i've been listening yeah. to a lot because my commute's like an hour <laughs> yeah right <laughs> oh so, yeah I sit in my car in uh, in LA traffic and and listen to podcasts all the time. Um, That's the my, best for driving. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's great. It's great. I um I've been listening to How Did This Get Made? Um, mm-hmm. With uh, mm-hmm. uh, and that's been a lot of fun. That's you know because they cover a lot of a lot of movies that that I know and and love and. Uh, you know, Hackers was a really good episode. So they're talking about Hackers. <laughs> that was one of those movies that, like, in the in the mid nineties, I think that movie came out in like ninety five or ninety six or something like that. And I was, you know, I was Sounds in high school, right, yeah. And uh, and that movie I thought was like 
I was like, wow, I can't wait for the future when I'm like right. flying around in the internet. <laughs> like, I can't wait for that. That's going to be so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't yeah. actually happen. Uh, Freaking you know, hackers. I didn't move to New York City and wear rollerblades all the time and go to clubs with ramps. And drink and, Jolt Cola. Yeah, drink Jolt Cola and, and <laughs> oh yeah, and hack on my uh, my laptop with my like Google Glass right uh, from a cell phone <laughs> yeah. or from a, a payphone in uh, in Grand Central Terminal or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. If only, if only. Yeah. But that podcast yeah. is hilarious. It's amazing. It's. <clears throat> Yeah. Super good. They do a bunch of live podcasts that are that are always a lot of fun. And is it um, all about movies? Yeah, yeah it's all it's cool. all about movies. So they uh, they do a bunch of movie stuff, and it's always it's always movies that that they didn't necessarily want to watch or they <laughs> wouldn't watch under normal circumstances <laughs> uh-huh. because they're not yeah. good movies necessarily, right? Um, yeah, but uh, but they're all so funny that like. You know, it's it's always just a good time to listen to them. You know, it's great. Yeah. yeah. And what is your all time favorite plugin? Redshift. Redshift right. for anything. Wow. No, no. That's it. N- not even a stall. No. Nope. Yeah. yeah no, I know, right? no, no question hesitation. about it. Uh, what is you know, it about I mean, it that you love so much? I think for for me, it's it's the fact that I can use it across. Houdini, Cinema 4D, For you sure. know, if I'm working with somebody who's working in Maya or whatever, you know, you can, you can use it in all of these different platforms and everything is going to come out looking the same. Like it's coming from the same render engine. Um, it's great. It's, it's fast. It's flexible. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. Um, I will say, you know, After Effects doesn't feel complete without the trap code suite, you know, but, yes. but mm-hmm. I almost feel like in a lot of ways, you can't even but treat now, that like a plug-in anymore. <laughs> but know? now Red Giant, Maxon, yeah. Red Shift, they're all one big happy family, right? And yeah, mm-hmm. I, I have no idea what's going to happen there. It's going <clears> to <throat> yeah. it's going to be nuts. It's gonna I'm be telling nuts. you, I can't wait. Super comp inside of C40. That's what I want. <laughs> hey, <it's>, it <laughs> yeah. may happen. It it's could very well beginning. now. Yeah, yeah. The Red totally Dawn, nuts. if you will. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um. <clears throat> also headphones oh yeah so i you know it's funny i bought these headphones and i'm using their these the ultrasound oh hfi what brand 780 is that? um and i've had these for forever um they've been they've been good to me i'm sure there are better headphones out there these days because <laughs> i bought these like <laughs> geez 10 years ago maybe like a long time but they've they've mm-hmm. held up remarkably well um from what i understand you can get uh like more of a felt kind of um earpiece cushion the mm-hmm. the leather cushion does make my head a little sweaty after i've been wearing them for a few hours but mm-hmm. uh you well know. it's felt now because you just touched it yeah ah oh. uh, dad jokes sing Thing. Gotta keep those dad jokes going strong. Uh, I can probably than- my stream deck to like make all the all the bad <laughs> noises and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> bum, 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 bum. Other than that, yes. uh, you know my my AirPods. I use my AirPods a bunch. Yeah, you know, especially yeah. at work, I can just like. I throw haven't them in been and- sure about those. Are those pretty good? I love them. They're amazing. Yeah. Uh, they they sound remarkably good for what they really. Are. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. And uh, the fact that yeah. I can just like have my phone in my pocket and be like, com- you know, not tangled up in the wires or anything like that. Uh, right. it, really, really, really cool. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I'm sure like I haven't really sampled the the gamut of Bluetooth wireless headphones out there. So it's For entirely sure. possible that there's some that sound even better. Or they work really well. Like I know people wear the ones that that have the little strap that sits around their neck so they can oh, like, yeah, take yeah. them out and they sort of dangle. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've never used them. i I'm sure they're awesome because people love them. Yeah. Yeah. Those bows though, man. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I wore my, I was telling my dad, I was up in Detroit and I'm, I was telling my dad about them and I'm like, man, these headphones, I've replaced the pads on them because I've just, I've worn them out, you mm-hmm. know? And, uh, just having those on a plane, man, this morning coming back, it's a lifesaver. You know, I didn't have a very good seat either. I was way in the back and you can Were you smell in the middle the, seat. 
No, thank goodness. Thank goodness. But you know, you you can smell. Dave the, doesn't do anything the, but a window seat. He has to be yeah. able to uh, orient himself to the ground. I get that kind is of a true story. If I, <laughs> if I don't, if I can't, kind of get yeah. my bearings, and I made him sit in a middle um, seat one time, and he was just furious was the whole time. It was awful. <laughs> yeah, because I just feel like I, I could cruel, be upside man. down for all I know. I don't. Yeah. But yeah. um, I'm sitting in the back. I've got the smell of the the lavatory. Awesome. I've got the exhaust. It's hot, mm-hmm. so you get that. You know when you're like hot from a heater because they're blowing the heater because it was cold there. Yes, you've got that heater on you, and you can uh-huh. smell exhaust at the same time, and it just makes you feel sick. Yeah. yeah. The only comfort I had was my <clears throat> quiet comfort, <laughs> <laughs> which was my headphones, the Bose, and uh, just flip them on, and at least. You know, some of that stuff just kind of went away. That's but. super nice. I'm gonna have to give those a shot. <laughs> yeah. If if you ever see anybody that has some that you know well enough to ask, just turn them on without anything except the noise canceling, no sound or anything. Just mm-hmm. yeah. listen to the difference. I've never heard anything that matches. But I awesome. I did uh, hear that the cancellation on the new AirPods is actually really good. Oh, I haven't tried the new ones. The AirPod Pro. Yeah, is that what pro. they are? That's what they're yeah. called, right? It's the Pro AirPod Pro. They're supposed to have really, really great cancellation. So, and yeah. <clears throat> smart people. All right, so you pull out your phone, and what is your muscle memory, your go-to app when you pull out your phone? Oh, these days it's Apple Maps. For sure. Just because, you know, part yeah. of it is, is I'm still, you know, learning how to navigate <laughs> around Los Angeles. This it's a it's not a small city. It's pretty big. Uh so just getting places and uh you know I was a diehard Google Maps user for a long time, but like for mm-hmm. some reason, at least on my phone, it's just it doesn't it's not it's not cutting it. Apple Maps is running running circles around them. So been using that. Really? I, yeah. I tried to use Waze. Um, and mm-hmm. Waze, Love I Waze. think is, I think it's really cool for places that aren't here because mm-hmm. yeah. I end up like down some weird little side streets, like taking, you know, lefts and rights and lefts and rights and like kind of zigzagging through these mm-hmm. tiny little streets. That way too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, where like, I found like here mm-hmm. I would, I would, even though it would take me, you know, 10 or 15 minutes longer, I'd rather just sit on the freeway where I don't have to worry about that. I just have yeah. to worry about not hitting the car in front of me, you know, right. uh, yeah. like, and, and just being able to kind of enjoy that, that time. Cause it, obviously in New York city, you're on the subway and you're just kind of like hanging on doing the thing. Right. And, and, uh, <laughs> then you get off when you need to get off, but here you have to be a little bit more engaged. Obviously when you're driving a car, you don't want to hit something. Is there anything you miss about New York city? Yeah. Oh, I miss all kinds of things about New York City, the walkability. I, I've, uh-huh. You know, we live in an area in L.A. that's actually pretty walkable, which is pretty mm-hmm. remarkable because um, most of the time you have to drive places. Right. But the walkability for sure, good bagels. I loved. And yeah. I was, <laughs> I was yeah. never a huge bagel guy until I moved to New York City. And I figured out, so like one of my favorite things on earth is uh, Szechuan peppercorn. If you guys have, have never had Ooh. anything made with Szechuan peppercorn, it is, um, it's what they call the numbing spice. Okay. So it actually kind of like numbs your mouth a little bit when you eat it. Um, it's spicy in quotation marks, but it's not that burning spicy. It's not even mm-hmm. like black pepper spicy, if you can, if you call that spicy. Right. It's, um, it kind of Muted numbs. Spicy. Yeah, it like numbs your mouth. It completely changes yeah. the way that food tastes. I love it. I absolutely love mm. anything that's made with Szechuan peppercorn. So the bagel shop up the street from our apartment, we discovered about two weeks before we moved, oh, makes no. a oh. Szechuan peppercorn <laughs> bagel. And they make a Szechuan peppercorn cream cheese, and it was oh, so good. Uh, my wife was making fun of me because right before we moved, I would, you know, every morning I'd get up and I'd have my morning coffee and be like, okay, I'm going to the bagel shop. I'll be back. That's you want anything? Uh, and I'd go get my Szechuan peppercorn bagel. Uh, incredible. I'm going to yeah, get so that Szechuan. That. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get that Szechuan. That's 40. it. I got to do it. <clears throat> um, and friends and, uh, and everything, of course. Um, you know, 
it's so quiet here sometimes. I kind of miss yeah. horn honking occasionally, <laughs> but I'm <laughs> I'm getting used to it. I bet uh, you sleep better. Yeah, yeah, sleep really, really well. It's uh, it's awesome. Uh, you know, we lived across the street from a where they were building a 54 story skyscraper in Brooklyn. Oh, nice. So mm, we had we had that that started construction started on that right after we moved in, which was super oh, cool. Oh. Um, mercifully, we had really good windows in our apartment because our building was was pretty new. But we did live right above a bus stop. So like 24 hours a day, yeah. you get the like the beeping sound and the yeah. like the lowering of the bus and uh-huh. the beeping and the raising and people yeah. yelling. And I mean, it's Brooklyn. That's it yeah. is yeah. what it is. It comes with the territory yeah. and like it drives you nuts for a day or two. And then you're like, you just kind of forget about it. It's like, just it's New just York noise. Yeah. yeah. Have you uh, my favorite Muppet movie, which coincidentally is not on Disney Plus. The only <laughs> one not on Disney Plus Seriously? is Muppets Take Manhattan. <clears throat> But that's their their thing. All these weird things happen through the whole movie, and they're like, eh, "It's just New York." Yeah, exactly. It's it's that's the only way you can really explain it. Uh, it's an amazing place. It really is. We used to live in an apartment across the street from a, or right next to like the tollway. You know, and oh, you yeah. get motorcycle racers at mm-hmm. all times of yeah. the day, and it was mm-hmm. so loud. <clears throat> I yeah. believe it. All right, last question. What is your favorite life hack? Oh, man. So this is a good one. Uh, I actually have one directed specifically to freelancers. Um, Sweet. Something that totally saved me when I first started freelancing. Um, If nobody has told you, you have to pay your own taxes. Mm -hmm. And nobody's going to take your taxes out for you. You're going to get hit with that nasty bill at the end of the year. Or if you've got an Mm -hmm. LLC or an S Corp, you're going to have to pay quarterly. So... The thing that saved me when I first went freelance is I opened four bank accounts. Jeez. I had a personal checking, personal Mm -hmm. savings, business checking, business savings. Okay, that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Those are the four four bank accounts. So every time I got a check from a client when they paid my invoice, I would take that check and I would deposit 60% of it into my business checking and 40% into my business savings. Business savings is for tax purposes only. I ignore that money. That money is gone. It doesn't exist. It's not mine. 40%? 40%. So I know that's way more than you need, but I would rather have more than I need. And then at the end of the year, I get kind of a refund, right? When I don't have to pay as much. But I would take 60% and I would put it into my business checking. And from there, I had, I had sort of determined after a couple of months of living in New York about how much I needed to pay bills and to enjoy myself in the city and, you know, buy groceries and, and that kind of thing, just living expenses. And I had like a hard number every month that I would transfer from my business checking into my personal checking and then just a little chunk into my personal savings just for my own purposes or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I would live on like a, you know, especially in the beginning when, when business was a little rocky and I wasn't consistently busy uh, just because I didn't know anybody and I was just kind of starting out. It was really important to be super regimented with your money because it's so easy, especially in a place like New York. Cause like when I moved from Richmond to New York, my bills tripled, you yeah. know, I went from paying like six twenty five a month for my one bedroom apartment to <laughs> yep. like $2,200 a month yep. for my right. studio. <laughs> it was I, like, I like, I like to give my brother-in-law who lives in New York. I love to give him crap because his rent on his 750 square foot apartment is the same as my mortgage on a 3,200 oh square foot house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Texas <laughs> mansions, man. It's crazy how expensive it is, but like, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. even buying there, like, so the, the building that I first lived in was actually a co-op, which is like, it's sort of a weird, I think it's a pretty New York specific thing. They probably have co-ops elsewhere, but it's, it's not like you're renting the apartment. You would end up like if you joined the co-op, you buy shares in the company that happens to come with a free apartment, which is sort of a okay. weird uh, I'm sure mm. tax reasons or whatever. I was actually renting in that building, so I didn't, I didn't buy in. But if I wanted to buy my 400 square foot 
studio in Upper West Side of Manhattan, it would have been half a million dollars. I was like, Jeez, oh my gosh. That's insane. <laughs> I can't. I can't do that. That's dumb. So save your money, um, kids. Yeah, yeah. Save, save your money. Your money. The, you yeah. know, the, the short version is I used my bank accounts to kind of regiment and plan how much I was spending. So I didn't spend all my money. And then when the tax bill showed up, I would have been like, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't have that money. It's gone. Mm-hmm. So I oh, oh, will, you know, like it's in you, Bill's house. Yeah. In George's so, house. The it's thing, gone. thing means the taxes. Yeah. Um, so that's my life. Yeah. <laughs> Four bank accounts for a cool. freelancer. That's smart. Yeah. I don't do that. Yeah. I just spend it all. And then at the end of the year, I'm like, all right, I owe taxes. We'll Better figure, figure it out. out. <clears throat> cool. I was really hoping well. my kid would come last year so that, you know, I'd get that good tax break. Oh, yeah. But no. Right? No. Uh, too late. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. <clears throat> cool. Well, we appreciate you being on, Russ. We're we're yeah, Russ. Uh, you're one of my we favorite really people in this industry. About this one. You're just you're, oh, like, yeah. you're so down to earth and so easy to talk to, and you're you're oh, you've always got a smile on your face, which well, I love. I try to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you guys so much for uh, <clears throat> for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Good chatting, and uh, hopefully, I'll see you guys. If not at uh, Camp Mograph, then you know at uh, NAB, NAB or Cigarette. Well, NAB, NAB yeah. man. Are you? That's I mean, you're so close to NAB. You, you should come. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. That's going to be a fun time. Uh, if people want to find you online, where can they find you at? Yeah, so uh, you can hit me on Twitter at robot astronaut underscore. Don't go to the other robot astronaut. That's not me. <laughs> um, my website, robotastronaut.tv, is uh, sadly pretty limited at the moment. It was <laughs> what I was able to throw together in a couple of nights before... Uh, I got in the RV and moved out here and I just haven't had any chance to <laughs> update it. It will get updated at one point, but for the moment it's pretty limited. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, usually you can find me under robot astronaut on most of the social platforms, Instagram, uh, where I am extremely inactive. I'm really on Instagram to, <laughs> to, to assist my wife's Instagram. She has a, uh, a hot sauce, uh, review and pairing Instagram called uh, Girl Meet Spice, which is awesome. Nice. Um, and I'm there really just to support. Um, mm-hmm. oh, but, I've got uh, some friends that make hot sauce. I'm going to have to like cook y'all up. Please do. Uh, mm, yeah. We, you know, she's super, super deep into it. And uh, that's, it's been a big part of our life, uh, certainly together and, you know, hers long before she met me. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we love, we love spicy things. That's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> Pinterest spice. and Vimeo so and, and all that stuff. You can usually find me uh, under Robot Astronaut. I'm kicking around. Cool. Cool. And we'll put a link to, to uh, your site and everything in the show notes as well. If anybody's awesome. looking for it there. Awesome. Uh, we're we're going to get out of here, though. You can rate us on iTunes, leave a review. It helps get our ratings up here in the new year. You can also subscribe on your podcatcher of choice. Check out the newsletter. We're going to uh, put another newsletter out, hopefully by the end of the week. Uh, I was just waiting to have a little more stuff for our course, so I could kind of squeeze. <laughs> Got to finish the, the course, newsletter. and then we'll send out the email. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you could say you've been there, done that. Got the T-shirt with the MoGraph logo T, the Paul Bab Feel the Bab 2020 shirt. All the profits from that go to Doctors Without Borders. Then there's the Render Things t-shirt, hoodie, long sleeve tee, and the That Render is Fire shirt, which you're only allowed to wear ironically. So check those out on the site. Buy them up. Make sure you get one. We might come up with a new shirt here before NAB for everybody to wear as Hashtag well. Hashtag stop you know. being afraid of Houdini. There, there you go. go. There you go. Um, and then we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, YouTube, MoGraph.com. And uh, I don't have to tell anybody to subscribe to this channel. Because if you're here, <laughs> but you're going you're to anyway. To this channel, <laughs> I want to say, make sure that you are are subscribed to the MoGraph channel from yep. now on, or else. All right, we're gonna get out of here though. Till next time, I'm Dave. I'm Matt. Russ. Have a good one. Later, yo. Pretty good, I guess.
MoGraph.com, an online resource for motion graphic artists. Start your week with the MoGraph podcast, industry news, interviews with your favorite artists, and terrible humor. Watch live shows and interviews from MoGraph events like NAB, SeaGraph, Half Res, and local meetups. <laughs> Our MoGraph talks feature live demos and motivation from artists all around the world. Sometimes you got to make stuff that you're not going to put on your reel, and I'm not here to judge. What if Rick and Morty show up for the countdown at midnight? That's where I peaked in life, in my career. we got to stop this thing, Rick! It's going to kill us all! Hear from the people that create your software, design your render engines, and artists that are changing the face of modern motion graphics. You get that render done. Yeah, you better frame, frame what? MoGraph tutorials and online classes will teach you about Cinema 4D, After Effects, as well as other popular software and render engines. Throw in the HDR Studio, take the render settings, pick the HDR, put a reflection, and gorgeous. Branch into new software, learn time-saving tips, techniques, workflows, and lessons that'll keep you up to date in the world of motion design. Oh, brother, those are some of my favorite elves. I love projects that scare me. When our art director comes to us and asks for something that I had never done before, man, it gets me pumped. Join the conversation in our live sessions. Check out our plugins or join the hundreds of daily active users in our Slack channel for technical help, advice, contests, or just to joke around. Real nice banana. Yeah, that's so funny. All right. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> Subscribe today and get the latest updates on our YouTube and other social media channels. Take all your dreams and just do it! We don't care how you get here, folks. Just get here. Subscribe to MoGraph.com.